Hello. 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 Okay, this is how you get the view of the territory. Pull it back to you. Where is the camera? On the screen, you can see. Hi. Hi. I don't know if you remember me. We met last year for one of your colloquia and the yes. thing. Yes. Hi. 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 So um, everything is, oh, you're just putting it up, right? Yeah. Uh, you're in biological science. Chemical science. Chemical science. Chemical. Anyway, in B block. Yes, B block. Absolutely. One day I walked up and down B block. Right, right, right. I saw your office. Right, right. I right, 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 right. Chemical science. Thank you for coming again. <laughs> well, no, no. No, I have to say, I have to give strong hints. <laughs> Please invite me again. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> a friend of ours, of course, that need uh, not have invited. Can we join the meeting? How to join the meeting? I, 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 you? Yeah, we yeah. have the internet connected. I mean, internet, internet, yes. Yes. And then click on Zoom. Uh, yeah, if you click on Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Click on Zoom. No, it will be Zoom. Just join the meeting. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Hmm. 979. Yes. Uh, this increase in the of your I think it only happens. So, Gagan is not here. Aha, Gagan, I am not very sure whether he joined to Zoom. He was okay. not feeling well. Okay, okay, okay. He's in Pune. Okay, okay. Yeah. In Kaman Kade. Okay, what is the connection? What is the connection? Is this one you're around tomorrow? I'm um I'm actually leaving for Kathmandu tomorrow. When? Uh morning. Oh, I see. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to go. Yes, we're going to go. There's a conference. We're going to go. Yes, because otherwise I would... Yeah, because I have to come upstairs. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What is path breaking? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> No, but the last thing is high power, you see? <laughs> Every single person here does something pathway. Can you share the screen? Potentially pathway. Huh? <laughs> share the screen. Share screen. Potential has become a very dangerous uh, adjective. Huh? Achha. <laughs> you have to use it uh, judiciously. <laughs> so, if I settle with Jayamo, then we can. Potential evidence, potential allegation. <laughs> okay. I don't know if the students got to be. Okay. The students are not subject to No. They are separate. How many Because, because students are the dynamic. This is not much right now. Maybe it's a chair. But how do you go to the next slide? Do you want to point out? How do I? Do you have a event? There's a program in your system. Mine that goes to all of them. The Mac? Mac is its own. Or not. And they don't do it for the email group of the 
for students and faculty and faculty, yes, yes, faculty, faculty but for prominent that will be lot more easy. Yeah, yeah. Because more, maybe we'll have to But that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Haan, so, we'll start again, but yeah. So, think. Last time, it was in Homi Bhava. Ah, big one. Yeah, big one. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'm an speaker in the picture. Which function? Shift them. Which one is shift them? Shift them. Last week it was in the last time. So, how did it look? I wouldn't mind this. It was here. How does this look? Can you see that? This is the right one. Uh, uh, top one feeling, uh, top one is Can I just do this? Okay, I will use this for the blue, right? Only It has contributed, yes. Needs that yes. Thing, right? yes, absolutely. You will stick, stick window. <laughs> Classical. <laughs> I, I don't know about these European experiments are very polite. <laughs> In Syria, people, of course, back there, everything was still. And if somebody in the audience, if the better discussion started getting too nosy or too irritating, <laughs> I have personally seen one person who was, who was quite a uh, character. At some point, just tapped the other person with a stick and said, Be quiet. Listen, listen. Multiple uses. Okay. Uh, 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 maybe just take a seat because Shashi will introduce you. So. Uh, that should be the if you switch it on from the side. Okay. That should be on. Okay. Small for the zoom. Okay, so uh, I welcome all of you from our one week hiatus on the Colloquia series. Um, so um, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Ashutosh Gopal once again to the Institute. Um, almost a year back, we heard a special lecture at the Homi Bhava Auditorium. Um, and he's back again visiting us. We thank Professor Gopal for are coming back again to GIFR and discussing the latest in particle physics. Um, before I uh, sort of uh, start the collusion, it would be nice if we get an formal introduction by uh, Shashi, who is a uh, contemporary collusion. So, uh, thanks, Yosemir, for giving me opportunity to introduce my friend. Uh, for a long time, I think since D0 days. Uh, okay. So, this is Professor Ashutosh uh, Goswal, who is from Duke University. Uh, he is a distinguished uh, uh, French London architect. 
and uh, it is created from uh, E665 experiment, which is a fixed target experiment at uh, Fermi lab, wherein uh, he carried out a precision measurement of the uh, part on distribution function using the data from prime and he joined uh, those two experiments at the Vetron, namely uh, D0 and CDF, wherein he, he actually, I think, almost uh, dedicated major part of his career to measure the mass of the W boson. I mean, many of the students here uh, who are uh, doing high energy physics would know the importance of the precision measurement of the W boson. And uh, in his recent publication, actually, you know, uh, the best precision that we have got so far on the mass measurement is almost like, I would say, 100 parts per billion. <coughs> so it is, you know, 0.1 parts in million. So it is to that precision it has been measured. And interestingly, it has been found seven sigma above the standard model uh, prediction. So this is one of the very pathbreaking uh, results that we have. And uh, it has been almost uh, single handedly carried out by Ashutosh in the data from the CDF. And as I mentioned, that he has been doing the same for the D0. And uh, uh, right now he's working for Atlas as well. Uh, and uh, very, you know, he also is looking for uh, new physics uh, with regard to the uh, branch of this, uh, the resonances and so on and so forth. Uh, so, as I mentioned, that uh, he's a frequent and distinguished professor at Duke. He also is a fellow of American Physical Society uh, and American Association for the Advancement of Science. And uh, he is the recipient of the Alfred P. Sullivan Foundation Fellowship and the Outstanding Junior Investigator Award for the Department of Energy. He received the Duke Leadership Award from the Duke University, a uh, Dean's Leadership Award, I'm sorry. And uh, again, uh, you know, uh, his roots are from the state of Maharashtra, and he has received the ABP Mother and Man Award from the Chief Minister of Maharashtra, and also was elected as fellow of Maharashtra Academic Science. And he has served as project leader for analysis, software, computing, or serial experiment. And he also was the head of the experimental particle physics group at Duke and in the physics department. And he served as the chair of the Formula Music Technical Committee. I mean, there are many things which I can uh, keep telling. But of late, I think he gave a very nice uh, uh, seminar on this uh, emerging technology. Basically, uh, he's into developing new technology for triggering on. Metastable charged particles at LSC like environment. So it could be for LSC or the future uh, collider experiment like ILC. And that is going to be really very interesting, uh, challenging, and demanding, particularly on the computing on the algorithmic side. And uh, he has developed uh, some of those algorithms by himself, which were published. And uh, we spoke about that in a talk given by him uh, during his visit here. So, with that, I would request uh, Ashutosh. To give his colloquium on the standard model of particle physics, <laughs> and uh, let's hear him out. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So, thank you for this kind of work, Shashi. And uh, uh, I should also say, in this last few weeks here at DFR, I've been visiting ever since I was a high school student in the Port area. Every once in a while, you would get an announcement that you know somebody is coming to visit, and public lecture is given. So, you would to school to your <laughs> and come out of the way. So ever since then, this was a you know very attractive place, and someday I was imagining one day you know being on the inside and being a member of this community. Finally, this is happening. So this last one month has been extremely enjoyable. Some of you have had time to, and you had time to talk, and we learned quite a bit. And I hope, as I said, I mean, say explicitly, if I get a chance to come back, I will be extremely delighted. In more than that. So please keep to go, okay. uh, bring me back again. So on that note. Let's see where we are with the particle physics model, the so-called standard theory, which historically has still been is still being called standard model. But now people say that many of its foundations are so well established, especially with this missing mechanism of mass generation, which is called the Higgs mechanism. And it appears to be working. Everybody knows worldwide the discovery of the Higgs boson was a huge splash for CERN. And since then, we are trying to see, in a way, a perspective, in a way, where does particle physics go from here? Occasionally, even the press in the US, especially, which is often negative on fundamental science like this, uh, I don't know why, New York Times and places like that, the last question, like, is it now time for particle physics to be over? Because you kept saying the only thing left to be 
understood as the Higgs mechanism, and now it's understood. So let's see whether we really understand everything. And the title is particularly nebulous. What we know and what we do not know, you know, depends on what the word know means. So I'll give my personal perspective. So this is some facts, but mostly how am I thinking about it? And the way I will interpret the title is, uh, you know, close to my personal area of research. So you can ask all kinds of interesting questions and I will pick only a few of them. So for a while, we used to hear this buzzword called naturalness, which was a strong motivator for more things. You can always say, you know, you never know what to expect because there are always like unexpected things in the history of science. Uh, if that matter is some particular thing, you might argue from astrophysics, we have evidence of that matter, or you might argue there is no reason for quantum field theory to have the full spectrum of all particles in it. There can always be more particles like history shows. And if they have the right properties, it can constitute that matter. So again, it's a matter of perspective. And do we want to build a more collider and so forth? So in this context, for the last 20 years or so, ever since the top quark was found, the matter content, the forces and so on were on very strong footing. And the attention had been on the Higgs mechanism or some kind of mass generating mechanism for a long time. But after 95, when CDF and D0 claimed the discovery of the top quark, which is obviously there, then it really, really shifted mostly to the Higgs, but at the same time, there were extensions already being talked about very extensively. The one that was most popular was supersymmetry. And so even at CDF D0, there were enormous groups specifically looking for supersymmetry, but other new physics ideas as well. So, so why? But on this front, I would say, I guess, two Nobel Prizes came out in general on the theme of the Higgs mechanism. So one was spontaneous symmetry breaking, I discussed that briefly, and one specifically on the application of that to uh, generating the masses for the WMZ bosons and also for the WMZ. So with that, I mentioned what list would you pick? So for uh, the next 50 minutes or so, I would start in this list, and mostly it's ordered specifically because starting at the top, my own research would be closest to this. Maybe it's somewhat then closer to this. I don't work on neutrino physics personally very much, so I'll put it at number five, even though there's lots of secrets there to be found. And then when you talk about more connections or lack of connection there are between quantum field theory and cosmological things like GR and so forth, and what about dark energy and is it really understandable or not understandable? Is there a crisis in the field? I will leave that to other experts. You have big groups there here that think about these things. So I'm not going to touch these last two topics, and I'm sure there are many other things you can have to do this. So let me start at the top. What are the successes? It all builds on what we sort of claim as we know. So you say we know special relativity, you know, testing special relativity is extremely exact. We understand quantum field theory, you know, even entanglement and so forth is now acknowledged with Nobel Prize. So you put special relativity together with quantum principles and group theory, and you get a very constraining framework. So that particular framework is so tightly knitted together that out of it now comes a very, I would say, axiomatic understanding of two things. One is what we mean by matter, and one we, what we mean by the quantized forces. So electromagnetism, electronic interaction, and the strong interaction. So those two I will summarize in two slides, that what we understand as a Fermi and why matter occupies volume and why Fermi behaves in Fermi Dirac 6 to 6. And so on. none of that is by hand put in, it all comes out of the framework. So there are axioms put in into those things, but then out of the axioms, you get these fundamental predictions. Long story, fast forward, the nature of mass has now been spent out into this particular structure that the lightest two quarks making up protons, neutrons, and the up and down, and the lightest two leptons that don't have the strong, uh, don't have the strong interaction is electron and electron neutrino. Uh, I think I still left this typo. <laughs> One of you always pointed out, and I forgot to make this big M has to be a little M. This big M has to be a little M. Those should be mini electron holes, obviously, not mega electron holes. But with that, now let's see what is mysterious about it. First of all, the generational structure is quite well understood. There's a theoretical reasoning at least from quantum mechanics, and now when you cancellation, it makes a logical sense. That it has to have this pattern. Perhaps you could argue there's a bit of a coincidence that the charges and so on in the multiplicities, how do they happen to arrange themselves just right that the particular anomaly I'm mentioning here is exactly canceled. So somebody might say there is a grand unified group that make sure that this will happen. 
So perhaps you could take that as an indication of something bigger. Um, then the other one that always sticks out is that the masses of the fermions is engineered by their coupling with the Higgs field. So this is started with uh, Salam and Weinberg with their model for leptons. But then you're just solving the problem by shifting the blame on something else. In other words, instead of explaining the range of masses, you are saying the Higgs interaction is very small for this particle and very big for that particle. Do you find that a very convincing explanation or a parametric explanation? My perspective, many people say this, that this is sort of a parametric explanation, but a deeper logic should exist. And then why are they, why are they stopping at three generations? We could have found four by now, five by now. Apparently, there were chiral fermions, and the Higgs cross-section should reveal that there should be more chiral fermions if there were. But the cross-section appears to be consistent with there being three chiral fermion families. And so why stop at three? You know, why wouldn't nature do four? Okay, that's how it is. I have heard some explanations that you know you could explain that number three, um, but remains to be seen. You have to get some experimental prediction from such a model and then see if you can check that prediction. Okay. Those predictions are fine, but generally you'd like to get predictions to be checked. The other grand success is how we understand forces. So in a sense, GR does this principle beautifully, that if you curve space, then the curvature itself generates force like terms, which you could call fictitious forces, or you could call them actual forces. And the same logic, when you apply them to the internal forces in which these quantum states live, then you get similar terms coming out. And you know, in GR, you talk about the covariant derivative. Similarly, in quantum field theory, you have the corresponding covariant derivative. And the interactions of the force mediators are very, this is a fermionic wave function when the covariant derivative contains the connection or contains the vector potential, it's the same thing. And then if that vector potential happens to have a curvature, so F mu nu is the curvature of that vector potential, which is similar to the curvature you get of the gravity, then the curvature you know, traced out like this will give you the kinetic energy. So that's now becoming a real degree of freedom when a photon propagates because it has kinetic energy and it interacts with the photons. So all of this is very nice and elegant. There is one parameter here, which is the gauge coupling between the fermion and this gauge transformation. So for every quantum force, there is one number. But other than that, you can see how compact and elegant this equation is. There's lots of axioms buried inside how you, you know, what this equation is trying to say, what this Lagrangian is trying to say. But with that, you can extract the equation of motion. You can do quantum field theory. Uh, you can do perturbative calculations, non-perturbative calculations on the lattice, and all of that technology is coming on, coming around very nicely. So everything here was good, except that gauge bosons had to be massless. And so after much, uh, somewhere in the 50s or 60s, the idea that you could preserve global gauge invariance but break it only at low energy by the lowest energy state of something, that became evolved into spontaneous symmetry breaking. So you would not lose all the benefits of gauge symmetry, but you would solve this mass less problem because the W and Z bosons appeared like they had a big mass. So before they were actually discovered directly, the indications from their interaction were they behave like gauge bosons, except unlike the photon, they appear to be massive. So what is happening there? So this was the idea that you would break this uh, gauge invariance principle, which means that you are allowed to change the phase of fermionic fields at every point in space, independently of every other point in space. That idea has to be somehow broken up by having some field which acquires a charge all over space. And how would you engineer that? That's when we are at the, with the standard model that simply a potential like this is invoked. And uh, you know, somehow at zero field, the potential is not minimum, but it is some kind of local maximum. So who knows what this potential will do elsewhere, but at least at zero field, it's not at the minimum. So something will happen and it will roll down to the lower energy state. And so it will pick some point on this uh, surface, and that will mean that it has chosen a particular configuration to settle down in. And so that kind of the configuration will break the symmetry. Right? If the ball was there, it was is there versus there, those are now distinguishable points. So the original symmetry where everything looks the same all around is now broken by that particular state. Now, the, all of this does beautiful things, and that's why there are you know, the evidence of the Higgs boson, which is the oscillation in the radial direction we have observed. But where this potential comes from, you know, when we learn classical electromagnetism or something, you get 
electric potential and so forth. So you just say, you know, electric potential looks like the charge over radius or electric field looks like charge over R squared. So all of this is just an electric potential interacting with charge objects. But in the gauge scheme of looking at things, there is no more electric potential. There is no more PCD potential directly. Right? It's all generated from this symmetry mechanism. Unlike that, we are still reverting in the Higgs section back to some by hand potential. So you might say there should be something better in the rest of the standard model. We have made significant progress and we are not putting in things by hand. But to engineer this particular situation for the Higgs, we are still putting it by hand. So we will see that the Higgs sector of the standard model is quite more parametric and quite more sort of phenomenological rather than being you know, dominantly axiomatic. Certainly there are very important axioms in there, but not everything is dynamic. So you might say there is more to be found here. Something must be happening. Okay. So looking at the Higgs is the first scheme I will pick. Which part of the standard model that we really understand is parametric and which part is substantially more fundamental. So I was indicating earlier the way we understand matter is now quite uh, axiomatic and fundamental related to mathematical principles where you don't just, you invent the axioms, but the axiom seems to be exactly what nature uh, seems to work as. On the other hand, the way you break the gate symmetry by the Higgs condensate is parametrically induced. And we have real condensed matter systems like superconductors and so on, where a real dynamical mechanism was discovered and it was found to work. So, you know, Cooper pairing and all of that is, is a huge insight into how electrons can bind by photons at low energy and into the superconducting state. So that's what I'm trying to indicate as a more fundamental understanding of superconductivity in a superconductor. But something like that is being engineered here, but without any dynamics that's explicitly been proven. People have ideas about it, but those ideas are not at the level where experimental evidence will show that that's the right idea. So we have things to do there. So as a one slide compare and contrast, you can see the fermionic and gauge sector with its uh, minimalistic description of a huge amount of physics, whereas not, not to uh, uh, somehow make a comparison of given inferiority complex, but nevertheless, you might say that the Higgs sector has substantially more parametric descriptions. And even the parameters of the potential, so first of all, the fact that you have to put a potential in by hand makes you think we should do better. And secondly, where do these numbers come from and why are they those particular values? Why the Yukawa couplings of the fermions, the Higgs give those particular values and then that enormous range of uh, fermion masses. Question? So when you say there's no dynamics, what do you mean? Why does it have to be the rotation sector and not in the same sector? Why does? You say the Higgs mechanism doesn't have any dynamics, and it's trying to understand what does it mean. I mean that the formation of the Higgs condensate is put in by hand without having a dynamical built in reason within the theory that tells you why the condensate forms. Essentially, why are the sign positive, not negative? I would go deeper than that. That is the first thing I would say. But even the fact that there is a potential put in by hand is to me and many people not appealing. Where in the presence of these terms do you see a potential? So that difference is because it's a scalar and that's a problem. Let me understand. Okay. Well, fine. You might then argue, yeah, uh, but, okay, we can discuss it further. You think because it's a scalar, it doesn't need to have a deeper explanation, whereas fermions are, uh, are, uh, are uh, expected to have something more axiomatic. Huh? Uh, yeah, as I said, it's a perspective term, right? So you can say the Higgs is doing just fine. So, I mean, on a related note, since you mentioned axiomatic. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what? So on the, the Fermion side, what, what do you think is actually axiomatic? This. Special relativity is axiomatic. Quantum field theory rules are axiomatic. And so the That's fact that theory, right? Axiomatizing quantum field theory is a million dollar open law. 
Every set of axioms will ask you to explain the axioms in terms of simpler axioms. But now that we've gone away from putting parametric potentials in many places where we used to have parametric potentials, right? long ago when we were doing classical energy mechanism, we were perfectly happy to do electrostatic potential. Right? Then you say electrostatic potential, one over R has some funny behavior and R goes to zero. Then you realize that what really happens is that the energy becomes so high that you start exciting quantum states, and the whole thing becomes a quantum soup of particle for bubbling in and out. And all of that makes a charge cloud, and the charge cloud renormalizes in a particular way. So the bizarre, oh, there's a problem over there in the theory, that problem actually gets resolved. Now, what it takes to resolve it is a set of axioms just to say, you know, quantum field theory is local, there's a Hilbert space at every point. You might say, oh, that all that is. Uh, a lot of axiomatic burden to explain a bunch of things. But if I then sort of count up the number of axioms that go into here, compared to the amount of physics you are getting out of it, I see that's an enormously better bargain than the amount of physics you are getting out of this compared to its fundamental inputs. Everything here is just engineered. How much are we getting out of this beyond what we engineer? Not much. You want to solve a problem, you engineer something to solve it. Certainly, some things here are also engineered, but you're getting far more out of it than what it was engineered for. I mean, if you actually look at the brilliance of gauge invariance, it, it's a gift that keeps on giving, right? It was invented for one or two things, but then it, it has this prediction it works out, and that prediction it works out. It's completely renormalizable, it works out. It's a theory that works up to all energies, but just changing the numbers that works out. I, I think people didn't even expect that much to come out of gauge invariance, for example, as the amount we have learned. People on the lattice are now almost close to getting fundamental QCD things out. None of that was how much are we getting out of this? That that's in a way what I mean. That's what I mean by engineering to get an answer you want to get as compared to some set of axioms that maybe you know, requires a book like this right now, but then it's explanatory power and it's future predictions are unanticipated gifts. That I would say is a difference between uh, what is captured by this little thing compared to what is captured by this. And then there are additional, your famous topic of what to do with ground state energy and so on. I don't know where you would lump it, so because he doesn't want to spoil this, I say I prefer to put it in the, in the Higgs part of the Lagrangian. Now that's a very difficult topic. So as you said, you saw it was on the last part of my list and I'm not going to discuss it. I don't know how to answer things like, does, does, does the ground state energy in quantum field theory or vacuum energy gravitate or not? For lack of better things, I will put it in the Higgs sector. Anyway, that's my way of explaining what I mean by the the, the cost versus the reward of the paradox. The gauge principle and so on appears to be very rewarding compared to something. Okay. Uh, Higgs, the signal is now very strong. This is Higgs to two Zs decaying to four leptons. And you can see, compared to the discovery, this is an enormous large signal. So whatever this state does, it is certainly existing. It's couplings to fermions, various uncertainty levels. You can see WZ is fairly precise now. Top is fairly precise. Bottom is harder and much more background. So it's a larger uncertainty. Taos are coming through, even the neon is coming through. So it's unlikely the LHC will ever do charm. So an E plus E minus collider is proposed to check that the charm coupling also scales with the mass. Uh, electron, that's not clear how one would ever do electrons. Anyway, things are in that model sense are coming along. And if you build another collider, they'll get that. Why is tau coupling is hmm. when it determined uh, then, to be so something smaller for tau? Oh, my guess, yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's not that much better, but uh, you can do better on suppressing backgrounds when the tau decays to lepton as compared to B. Huge amount of BB bar background comes from this QCD production of B. So yeah, it's a little tricky. You have to find things that are boosted and so forth in order to isolate the tau signal. 
But having said that, because there's at least one left on there, that's significantly better than these, where the rate is huge. So the QCD background rate is absolutely low. So that always makes it harder to get the big signal. There's a question from Gagan. Gagan, yes. Gagan, hello. Gagan, could you ask your question? Unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, because I was not able to mute, unmute myself. So, just a small remark, I suppose, about the electron coupling part that you said. I just thought I'd make this remark that if we do E plus E minus collider, and so in some indirect way, I think the hope of getting direct coupling of electron with Higgs is not possible, at least in my lifetime. But this uh, E plus E minus uh, collider going to Higgs trial, so that in some way you are taking into the coupling, I mean, the direct Higgs production or some way people say, uh, one can talk of the electron coupling to the E plus E minus collider. So I thought I will make that remark. So brother, did you have a question for me or a comment? Remark. Remark, remark from Gagan. I think Gagan, you were saying that it may be possible to have an S channel collider, E plus E minus going to Higgs. So you sit on the Higgs pole and it will be a very yeah. yeah. But Something of that sort I, I read somewhere. And anyway, I thought direct coupling is not possible. That's, that's what the way I look at it. Yes. The idea, what I, I'm pretty sure is that a 125 GV plus C minus collider, this seems like an easy thing to build. But the pole, you know, when you see the Higgs pole in E plus C minus annihilation, that is expected to be too small for making any of the other worthwhile. So I'm, I'm curious to hear if there's some other idea to see Higgs to Okay, so here is the potential we stopped and we're discussing, you, know, you pick some numbers and how does it become negative? That's one thing, but to put in some potential just to make something happen, I think you put one thing in and you get one thing out. That's what I meant by, are you getting a big reward out of it or you're just getting out what you put in? Okay, that's my way of looking at it. But then do you truncate the potential here or you add additional terms and what could the shape be? Well, it could be whatever. So clearly when you start exciting near the minimum, you only need the quadratic and the quartic with some symmetry that is no cubic. But then that truncation is essentially, as far as I can tell, motivated by the fact, A, why add more things if you don't need them? To, to see that there will be such a state, you don't really care what the shape will do far from that minimum. And secondly, if you want to have predictive power, then terms like this uh, at higher and higher energy will kick in at a bigger and bigger rate. So then if you don't truncate, then in some sense, you're just losing predictive power. So if your ambition is that you want to have predictive power, you simply say, I will cut off the, the polynomial to do the least I can, and then I have the simplest model that will make a prediction. But apart from this, I don't know if there's an actually good reason to have a potential like this that was engineered to be truncated, therefore. So you could turn that around if you've seen the state near the minimum, then why not do experiments which will see what the shape of the potential is. And if there is some dynamical thing, then that additional dynamics that produces the actual shape in nature will have its own parametric form and maybe we will actually discover why that shape happens to be that particular shape. So bottom line is that if you just sort of say what could happen next, it is quite possible that order one deviations in the shape of this potential as you go away from that minimum are possible. So this is the reason that people say the self-coupling of the Higgs, which is a way of extracting what that shape looks like in some power series, for example, that that self-coupling should be measured quite precisely because if you expect order one deviations, then even 10% measurement, 30% measurement, any of that would be quite adequate if there was a factor of two deviations from your expectation, then 30% can be quite good. So we don't know. So a lot of discussion here. I will just take this one slide. People have tried to do this for the LHC. After much work, people say maybe you could do 50% even with the LHC. Then this is a big topic for the International Linear Collider. How far could it get on that front? That depends on the energy of the linear collider. So should it start at 250 GV center of mass or 500 or 1 TV? 
a lot of the motivation to go to high energy apart from the physics searches is to get this one number print down and if there was a big deviation there you would immediately know that more have was happening in the Higgs sector and you know, could start a lot of investigation. So this is a proton-proton machine in a big tunnel, 100 kilometer tunnel. And if you could do proton collisions at 100 TV, depending on the luminosity, three inverse at one study in the sun. This is all, you know, we don't know exactly all the running condition things, but the community has been there before, right? And for a long time ago, people were predicting how well the Tevatron could do. People were in the business of predicting how well the LHC would do. And after some time, the experience is that analysis techniques and understanding of detectors starts to proceed well enough that quite often, even in this messy environment of proton collisions, the analysis techniques and the quality of the detectors themselves can be so good that these predictions can end up being conservative. So they, you know, you have to balance some conservativeness against some optimism. And it seems people are trying to do it in different ways. And you can see 30%, 5%, depending on if you get high, high velocity. So the level at which you would call this precise is to be compared with an a priori expectation that maybe the Higgs potential looks quite different than what that minimal polynomial is. So this could actually end up being, in hindsight, a very precise measurement, actually. That would lead to all kinds of data. So this buzzword of naturalness has been thrown around for a long time. For the last six or seven years, it's somehow not mentioned often enough, but it was stated quite a bit in the left era and the beginning of the NFC era, what is this natural risk business? It was recognized long time ago that when you put a single scalar into a quantum field theory, then when you do quantum loops with such a scalar, there is nothing, no, some of those, you talked about the other axioms, Things like gauge invariance and so on give you all kinds of special reasons why the, the photon remains massless and why quantum corrections doesn't go in this symmetry and doesn't go in that symmetry. Whereas there are no such special symmetries protecting the Higgs mass. And so, for example, even I could do uh, this particular loop and it has this form that you can see on dimensional grounds. Then, if you integrate that to uh, you know, infinity, then the thing diverges with the upper cutoff square. So this is called the famous quadratic divergence in the mass of the Higgs when you do all the formal corrections. On the other hand, the observed state is obviously far, far lower than infinity. So this goes under the name, naturally quantum corrections would make this particle heavy, but the observed thing is extremely light. So this cannot be some kind of magic. You can call it renormalizability, but this is renormalizing Renormalizability has been abused in some sense by having to fine tune the original number so well that you start with a huge number and then the correction is some huge number and the difference is very small. And how can nature engineer this in some, some magic? So people will say this is unnatural, you need a better answer than this. Some people say, well, so what? Don't have to bother with any of that. So it's a question of whether you find some of the explanations elegant enough or you think, no, those are the clues. So depending on your perspective, you can take the unnaturalness of the standard model as an important clue. Now, other things in the standard model that showed out of, that came out of Bayesian values, for example, have been now understood as enormous uh, insights. For example, when the same thing happens with QCD, this is that famous uh, result from 1973, that the QCD running to quantum loop effects, this is the many body nature of quantum field theory, that this cloud of gluons and colored quarks and everything behaves in such a way that effectively the strong coupling gets weaker and weaker as you go to higher energy. And so this somehow is telling you that QCD is so elegant that at very, very, very high energy, you sort of take the reductionist approach to its limit, that everything starts out from the smallest, smallest, smallest things, and then big things get made out of the small things. Then in that small, small, small limit, QCD becomes a free field theory, that it, all the coupling really just vanishes. This, this function will just vanish to zero logarithmically, but nevertheless, it will just keep getting smaller and smaller. So you're starting with an extremely simple theory, and all its complexity and everything evolves internally from within the theory because of quarks splitting into gluons and gluons splitting into quarks and so on. So here is something that you didn't put in by hand when you said it was SU3, right? But it's, it's an amazing 
uh, outcome. So you say, ah, nature must like this. This is this is quite elegant. You start simple and you get complexity out of simplicity. Okay. So and this has actually been measured. So one takes quantum corrections seriously, I would say, and anything that appears crazy like this, like 10 to the 19 tuning of a priori parameters, if you saw the Empire State Building sort of balancing on its state, you would say, yeah, it could be arranged. You know, I could make sure that it balances exactly, but you know right away it's an unstable equilibrium. And so if you come back next day and still it's standing upside down on its tip, you would say somebody is holding this up. This cannot be balancing like this. You know, any little gust of wind or something would not be moving. So that's the philosophical way of looking at what could be up with the Higgs uh, under quantum directions. This quartic term also behaves a little odd. You could now make Higgs, 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 Higgs with a quark uh, top loop here. And so depending on the top quark, there is a Yukawa coupling there. And that Yukawa coupling can do interesting things because the loop effect is generating an additional part of the fourth term. And that term, people, for example, Paul Steinhardt shows this when he talks about cosmological things that depending on what value the top quark mass has, this number will change because it will have the additional effect uh, from such a loop. And if you go, this is Planck units, we figured out yesterday, uh, this was in Planck units. So if the Higgs field approached some fact fraction of the Planck scale, which is relevant, right? Gravity is around us. Then the Higgs potential, instead of going up, will actually turn down because of the effect of the top quark loops. So you say, well, we, we, we like nature to be near the minimum. If the potential turned upside down, now what will nature do? Will it find out the fact that this is a local minimum and the, there is no global minimum? In that case, uh, why are we sitting here? And why is not the whole thing run away down the hill and all kinds of crazy things? So we couldn't have space the way we have. So all that kind of tracks is good. And people have written about this that the Higgs mass we have tells you what the original lambda is in some sense. The top quark mass tells you what the top Yukawa coupling is. And you do the mathematics and you find if the top Yukawa coupling was too large, which means the mass was too large, we'd be in an unstable region. And we happen to live in the unique set of numbers of this Higgs mass and this top mass, where the lifetime of that state is long enough that we are metastable. So I don't know what trillion years or something like this. So it's okay. We've been around for 13 billion years, we'll be around for long enough. And nobody has to worry what happens to the vacuum after we are all gone. Okay. But is, is that a coincidence or is this some hint that there is some mechanism going on to make sure things show up there? You know, why not here and why not there? So none of this is a proof of anything, but there are coincidences that make you think the Higgs, I would say, is a strange beast compared to the Fermions and Higgs. So you could say, yeah, Fermions and Higgs bosons are stronger things and scalars are a little awkward, but uh, fine. So on the other hand, if there were additional symmetries or dynamics motivated by the knowledge that we now have such a field, uh, maybe it makes more sense. So one idea which the LLC is not yet probing very strongly. So this is when people say, you know, isn't the LLC done? I would say there are a few things that may end up telling us what is beyond, but the sensitivity of the LLC is still pretty weak in this. So here is a process which I would uh, put out in, in that in that vein, that the idea of making particles light, one of the ideas that is around for a long time is that when you break any global symmetry, you get this Goldstone mode. And the Goldstone mode fundamentally is a, is a massless mode. So if you want to create a light particle and keep it light, then that idea works beautifully. But the whole complication arises that you don't want a massless particle, you want a light but not massless particle. And so the, this engineering is hard. So lots of papers have come and gone on how you make a light Higgs boson from this idea, but not a massless boson. Massless is easy, but light, but not too heavy and not too light is, is, is difficult. Having said all that, what can we prove experimentally? If you look at this particular topology, that two quarks coming in will emit longitudinal vector bosons, which are Higgs states. And when they collide, it's like pions colliding or something like this. You may get direct access to some dynamics hiding in this sector. So one should look at this topology. And this was always motivated by the SSC and the LHC, that this topology is to be considered very seriously. So if there was some dynamics there, then 
Just like if you collide pions, you will see the dynamics of QCD inside the pions. If you collide longitudinal vector bosons, uh, you might get some additional resonance created there. And depending on what might happen in this way of looking at things, those things will decay back to the pions of this interaction, which means the Higgs states and the longitudinal vector boson states. So if you draw a picture like this, these quarks are emitting uh, these longitudinal vector bosons, and they may interact by the creation of some new dynamical state there or a, a power of states, whatever. And they will either decay to Higgs's or W's and Z's. And if you take the minimum uh, like QCD again, you know, pi plus pi minus pi zero, what is the ratio producing these three? From some symmetrical logic, you expect a ratio of pi plus pi minus and pi zero to be equal. The corresponding logic there tells you you expect a particular ratio for Higgs and W's and Z's to come out when these things decay. So if you saw such a thing, you would say, yeah, this is really starting to look like some internal constituents of the Higgs and there's a particular dynamics like this. And that would suddenly make some of these, what I call engineering things, go away. So it's a portal, what I would call a longitudinal vector boson portal. And if the physics hides there, it means it hides only in the things that interacts with the Higgs. So it could then become very difficult to see with electrons or neons, you know, light quarks, ups and downs. These are the particles we collide all the time, but they have no direct interaction because this is all hiding in the Higgs sector, and the Higgs sector only interacts with heavy things. That's the way it's engineered. So just because the LHC hasn't seen much doesn't mean this stuff couldn't be there. This is exactly the kind of stuff that only shows up in very specialized places like this. And it's all low rate because you're emitting a weak boson there and another weak boson there, and it has to interact here. So you just add up all the powers of the weak couplings, uh, and the energy is being reduced as well because you're radiating uh, uh, particles. So put all that together, and you can compute the numbers, and they all end up being very small numbers. So even though the LHC has run for 10 years, if you ask how sensitive we are to processes in this topology, we're actually barely reaching the sensitivity of even certain standard model process, barely. And so that's why one of these papers came out in nature because after n years of running, you're starting to see electroweak vector bosons being produced this way. Barely seeing the standard model data, let alone Okay, so on the next front, um, lots of discussion I'm sure has happened with dark matter. Let's not even talk about the evidence or whatever the interpretation is. But you might say if field theory allows for new particles and there happen to be stable particles with very small coupling, would they then behave like that matter? The answer might be yes. Okay, so from a particle theory perspective, you could come at it the other way. Let's just investigate tensions that have such particles, weakly interacting heavy particles, and how would they interact with the other particles that we have? So existing particles may annihilate to dark matter or dark matter may through that small interaction, make standard model particles, or you can do a scattering in this direction. Dark matter scatters with a nucleus or something like this and bounces off. So you can do experiments in all three ways of interpreting a picture like this. This is the direct detection, the big industry. You see the mass of the so-called dark matter particle versus a scattering cross-section, and experiments have been proposed and have been happening for a very long time. So where in this context could you put some field theory metric? For example, if that particle were mediating an interaction with standard model via the Z boson, which was a favorite for a time, because that you know, other things are interacting with Z, is why not this thing? Then you can see above this mass range, the, uh, the rate of the interaction cross section would have been way up there. So many, many years ago, that was the exciting thing. Yes. Now, at least for masses of dark matter particles above a GV, you can see that particular threshold has been completely crossed. Yeah? So nothing showed up. Now, lower masses, the recoil that you are detecting as a dark matter bounces off a nucleus. For light dark matter particles, the recoil becomes so small that you know, technically it becomes very difficult to detect. So these experiments are pushing very hard to detect low mass particles. That is their bit. But having said that, at least up here, you can see this is out. What is happening soon is the kind of cross-section that could be mediated by Higgs exchange, since we know that happens now, is becoming some kind of next threshold. Again, that only works for high mass, and this is going to be 
difficult. But you will see at least for heavy Higgs mass, uh, heavy dark matter particles, the next few generation of direct detection experiments, if they don't see anything, are going to cross the Higgs exchange. So then we start getting into territory of what other mediator there might be. But it's worth at least crossing the Higgs uh, because uh, that's a mediator that we have. Okay. Where colliders come in is mediators from dark matter to standard model, which, uh, for example, are axial vector. So those then, when they scatter off a nucleus, you don't get coherent scattering, you get incoherent scattering. So direct detection becomes much, much difficult, more difficult if the mediator is an axial vector because you don't get coherent scattering. Vector mediators, you would say in general, direct detection would be uh, colliders hands down. When you get to Higgs-like mediators, they all have interactions which are Higgs-like, which means they're sort of proportional to mass. So a nucleus is, is full of light quarks. So you know, scalar mediators are hard for everybody. Colliders have a hard time making Higgs-like things, and direct detection will have a hard time doing Higgs-like things. So if you're unlucky and there is some dark matter thing, but it only interacts via scalar mediators, this would be a long run of thing. It's not clear what kind of such thing you get. But this one plot showing mass of the mediator versus mass of the dark matter particle, you can see the complementarity. These curves here are the collider curves. So you can take LHC, uh, you can take ILC, you can take some 100 TV collider. And obviously this is shown as a way to see what a feature collider can do. So it's the axial vector mediator that is chosen because that's where a collider does much better than a direct detection experiment. So when, what are colliders good at? Try to make the mediator directly. So something collides and you make that C prime or whatever it is. That's what the center of mass energy is good for. So colliders are good at going along this axis. So you excite the mediator directly <coughs> on resonance or something like this. Whereas indirect detection, uh, scattering, something like this. That's where if the mediator becomes very heavy, then the cross section becomes too small. So you're not caring so much about the mass of the dark matter particle because it's already out there and it just bounces off and so you don't have to make the dark matter, it's there. So those experiments are pretty good at stretching out the sensitivity in terms of the mass of the dark matter, but not in terms of the mediator mass where the cross section would fall off. So then you would not see it. Uh, Shashi, you mentioned this, so I'll just say what else can happen, what else should we be trying? We have all the standard signatures, but here is a particular model that is starting to come into vogue because the simple stuff is getting ruled out by the LHC, so people start looking at the more difficult things. For example, this could be supersymmetry or it could be any other model where you have some degeneracy between a charged particle and the neutral partner. And because they're so degenerate, when it decays, it decays to a very low momentum thing, which you cannot track. And this could be stable enough to be dark matter or whatever, but it would just go out of their detector. So if such a process was going on, the only hope you have to see it is to be able to track very quickly the charged uh, parent particle before the whole thing becomes invisible. So this is called the famous disappearing track. So I wanted to flash this. To show a couple of papers, uh, I was very interested in pursuing how you could do this by tracking particles in other ways. So as you all know, typical tracking is done by Kalman filter or some kind of successive uh, you know, project from here to here to here. So I'm thinking of a different way based on graph computing concepts. Uh, and just flash this reference and you can see how it does. Uh, next step was to see if we can turn that into a trigger. So here is an illustration of a segment of the silicon tracker where a bunch of particles have gone through. So those points are there. Embedded in here is a high momentum particle like the ones you'd like to find. And the question is, can you process all of this information, all this huge cloud of points to find as quickly as the collider is running the embedded charge particle there? Okay. So you would need some special circuits. So that algorithm was published here. And the third one is now actually submitted for publication recently, where an FPGA implementation of this other way of doing it seems to be working in the sense that we're simulating it, uh, says that you can get 40 megahertz throughput, which is the LHC position rate, and a latency of 25 and 250 nanoseconds, which is significantly faster than the LHC trigger time. So they give you a five or four microsecond window, and this is quite faster than that. 
and quality, you know, low fake rate, efficiencies are high. So worth pursuing. So this is the sort of thing I'd like to come back and discuss some more. Okay. Last few things. So big other issue, you know, people have calculated if there is more matter than antimatter in the universe, which appears to be true, experiments are looking for uh, if there is some antimatter dominated part of the universe or something. But if there is more matter than antimatter, then there's been a big discussion. There are the famous Sakharov conditions. Can you get that in the standard model or not? I'm just going to focus on this last point. In order to capture any asymmetry that could be produced by some few theoretic interaction, whatever, to capture it, you need to be out of equilibrium so that it doesn't, when the reverse process doesn't gobble it back up. So it's been worked out in the standard model that if you raise the temperature, so this is sort of non-zero temperature quantum field theory, that the Higgs potential at high temperature would have this shape. And as you cool it down, it collapses very slowly into slowly meaning rate at which the universe is cooling from a shape like this to a shape like this. So this is how the Higgs field would sort of roll down. So now that transition has been computed and found to be a smooth transition. And so this is not the kind of transition you need to create the out of equilibrium situation. You need a transition where what is called a first order, strong first order transition, where that Higgs potential shape at high temperature is like this. But when it goes down to the shape that we want, which is minimum over there, then that transition happens along these set of lines rather than along these set of lines. So in the standard model now, knowing the Higgs mass, this is what you expect from calculation. But what you would like to have, if this phase transition, you could have some other phase transition. <coughs> But if the Higgs phase transition is to be exploited for this purpose, then it has to be engineered in some way, some, something new has to happen. So in other words, the Higgs mass that has been found is a bit too uh, heavy. If it was light enough, you could have had this, so that would have been nice. But it's heavy enough that it actually does this. So now you have to put in something else to, to go back to looking at something like this. So an additional scalar goes on or something else that it might interact. Basically, it means the kind of Higgs transition that happens here is from the unbroken phase everywhere when things start cooling down. It has to create little bubbles of the broken phase when the Higgs has rolled down. And these bubbles have low energy than the outside, so they would expand rapidly. And so whatever is happening at the boundary, they would capture the asymmetry and the asymmetry would get frozen in inside the bubble. So this is called bubble nucleation. So you would have to have this. But can you engineer this? Uh, you know, what would you have to do with the standard model to do that? Uh, some people were looking at lots of people have written papers on this. You could add a single scalar which has absolutely no standard model charge. So it would be very difficult to detect any other way. But it would interact via the Higgs. And uh, so you look for processes in which the Higgs is helping you to access this other scalar. And the idea is if you want that phase transition to be first order, then that other scalar cannot really decouple from the standard model. Then it doesn't do the job. So we are back to some engineering, but OK, we do that first as usual. So it has to be light enough, and its couplings have to be big enough that it modifies the heat phase transition sufficiently to get the phase transition that we want. And so that gives a bounded parameter space. The mass has to be not heavier than something, and the coupling has to be not too small. And so that tells you a target that's Either you exclude it or you see it. So it's not that it can just decouple and it can be true forever, but just beyond your reach. This has a defined scope in which you either find it or you don't. So it's the kind of thing that's worth pursuing. And what this is saying is that the high enough collider with a high enough luminosity, you can actually discover it fully. Okay. Uh, not to go much longer, I will have only one slide on neutrinos. Questions there? I think we will have many talks on this. Uh, what is the absolute mass scale this is a nice question. Whether there is lepton number violation in the neutrino sector is a very nice question, which you know, neutrinos are really able to have that possibility for you. So it's worth investigating. So now that oscillations have been observed, that means the mass eigenstates and flavor eigenstates don't coincide. So what kind of differences between their masses? Is it this pattern or this pattern? You know the numbers, but you don't know which way they get ordered. So that is the famous uh, mass ordering situation, which Fermilab and, and Hartmut and so on and so on are trying to go after. 
And then this is the CKM equivalent in the neutrinos where you have a matrix that mixes mass eigenstates and flavor eigenstates. So like the CKM matrix of the quarks and whether there is a CP violating phase in here could be there or maybe somebody will say ought to be there, but it's nice to actually experimentally go and find it. Right? It's there we should find. So we'll know at least uh, if there is such a phase and what one will have within its uh, phase. So you mentioned precision physics, so I'll quickly flash this result that we talked about, trying to see if quantum corrections affect the mass of the W boson enough that we might actually see a significant deviation from the standard model calculation. So I'm just going to flash the standard model calculation with the Higgs found and the top quark mass and so on measured well enough. Because there is a precise prediction, you are motivated to go measure it. Because if the prediction was weak, you wouldn't know what to do with the measurement. It's one way of looking at it. Could you have deviations from new physics? Yeah, all these ideas have been published. I'll just flash their names. For example, a single scalar with no standard model charges, so it's almost a sterile scalar. Even that one through the Higgs mixing and so on makes an impact on the calculated value of MW depending on the mixing angle. So something to be investigated. And that's the same kind of scale that I mentioned earlier. If it messes up with the Higgs potential enough, it can induce the first order phase transition that we like for other reasons to create the value of this. Could there be supersymmetry within exclusions that are quite significant now? There are still pockets, so people still pursue quantum effects of supersymmetric particles within the you know, non probe pockets, and things are still possible. So here's that number, and I'm not going to discuss too much because that will take its own seminar. People talk about, you know, what about the difference from the other measurements? So one should look at our paper, one should look at our old papers, look at the techniques measured used by Atlas and so So it takes a detailed discussion of how exactly this is calibrated, how exactly that is done. We are doing things differently in the different experiments. And so when it's not enough to just look at the numbers, you have to look at how they are of things. That's my one comment on it. But having said that, we have a history of things like small deviations being you know, later on found to be important things, like the famous Lamship telling us that vacuum fluctuations do occur even in the hydrogen that we can detect apart from the molecule. So similarly, you know, a bunch of people go and say, what could the W mass anomaly mean? And so people try to say, well, if you extended the Higgs sector, it might explain. If you extended the gauge sector, so additional force can explain. If you have additional matter content of a particular kind, it can explain. So as usual, you know, precision measurements don't are smoking gun things. It doesn't have a direct inter intervention as this or this or this, which direct signatures do. But you take every clue you can get. So here is one big clue that uh, we found. Okay. So what next will happen? Of course, direct detection has to continue. But there is scope for precision measurements also, since I've worked on it for a while, I keep putting this up. What else could be happening that the Higgs sector may need, for example, to, to reduce some of its engineering? A symmetry like supersymmetry or some additional symmetry that makes it suitable stone. Some dynamics that makes Cooper pairing like mechanism to make the scalar, we were discussing earlier, it's got things because it's a scalar. Some people say, you know, if you start with fermions and build scalars from them, things are much more natural. So people are talking about a big E plus E minus machine next. I'm just going to flash options that have been discussed. The technically, uh, apart from just brute force construction of the tunnel and so on, the European proposal, which is a 100 kilometer tunnel or Chinese proposal are on the table. The other one that's been around for 10 years now is a straight superconducting radio frequency linear collider. So electron beam this way, proton positron beam that way. There is a new kid on the block, which is instead of superconducting RF, this is the slack people talking about this. You go back to copper and the gradients they're getting. So how many megavolts per meter can you get, which defines the length of your accelerator and the cost and everything. Rather than 35 megavolts per meter or so from superconducting RF, they are claiming 100, 120, so three to four times more. And if this technology matures and becomes reproducible and so on, they have already said you could build the same physics potential of the ILC with cold copper cavities, you know, machine just right and so on, with one third the length. So that's a huge benefit technically cost-wise. 
there is an electron drive weave thing, it has been around for a long time. I don't know where it will go. A big proton machine has been talked about, for example, around CERN. CUS used to talk about it. There, the big deal is the magnetic field has to be not 8 Tesla, but 16. And the niobium titanium being used everywhere now only goes up to 8 or 9 Tesla. So 16 Tesla needs a new material, and that's a huge technical challenge. Okay. Last one is muon collider, which has so many technical challenges. But if you want something in the far future that is point light collisions at 10 PV, then electron doesn't do it, and proton is not point light. So muon collider has its own champions. And the whole issue here is it's a brilliant machine from physics perspective, but its technical challenges are by far the largest of anything that I could do last year. So we don't know. Having said that, I think we start to stop. So on the future front, you can see some perspective of mine why we should keep going. Uh, e plus E minus collider, it needs very high luminosity um, because we're looking for small deviations which are moving down. Proton, apart from the magnet, the rest you know how to do. Neon, there are many things that we don't know how to do. And E plus E minus, I guess mostly we know everything what we want to do. So, so if you have the money, one can do E plus E minus. So. But here's some motivation, and I think we'll see this guy. Right. So, on that note, we'll stop right here. I'm happy to go over questions. You don't want to bring your point up again? The scalar? Me? Yeah, another question, I right he said we'll come back to it, so nobody else has a question. Yeah, it's true. It is not the but ah. they say is that uh, even the scalar particle that potential comes in, and you cannot write such a potential for content. It's just from the structure of content. Uh, it is just you ask Very good. what are the terms you can put in that are not subtext, and then you get that for scalar. And so I love experimenting this. I love Fermions because when it tells you you can only do this and not something else, that's a great thing. So, so I like that elegance. You cannot do this, 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 and this is the only way, and then nature says that's what works. You feel like you really understood some secret of nature. To say that scalars allow potentials and therefore it's enough to stop at potentials seems not so satisfying. I mean, so philosophical point. Well, yeah. Tell me that. I mean, that's known. Uh, um, the other question that you asked, why is it in the book and phase? Why is the mixture position negative? That I don't think comes from what you said. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, my question why is it a challenge to build a new collab? The biggest part is. The muons come out from pion decay, so the beam has the original muons coming out of the production system has a huge phase space. So you have to cool them. In order to get a collider, you have to get a very tiny phase space, otherwise you get no luminosity. So that's what is called the cooling of the muon beam. So, for example, it was the big wife, Simon Van der Rohe was given a share of the Nobel Prize, is a similar issue with antiprotons. So for WZ discovery, the W was antiprotons, which of course you blast protons into a target, and one in a million of the products is an antiproton. So you filter everything out, you collect the antiprotons for a long time, but again you have to cool their phase space so that you can make a compact beam. So the discovery of the invention of stochastic cooling by Vandermeer was worth the Nobel Prize to enable that whole thing. Why can't you use stochastic cooling for muons? Because protons and antiprotons will last a long time. You have good enough vacuum, you can store them for a day. And so stochastic cooling was this. Most of the time, you are not cooling most of the antiprotons, but on average, you are applying a little bit of cooling every time. And if you keep doing it over and over and over again for a day, eventually the antiprotons get cooled. But the neons, even with all this boost, are not going to last for a day. They are going to last for 50 microseconds or a millisecond or something. So stochastic cooling is not an option for the young people. Just don't have the time. So the only part that has been thrown around is basically what you would call dissipative cooling or resistive cooling. 
which means you blast the muons to a gas of electrons, and you let the kinetic energy of the muons be carried away by the electrons, <coughs> and then you re-accelerate the muons, and then you go put them again through a gas of electrons, or then so. You are always putting your energy in one direction, but the cooling will take energy out in all directions. So that way you keep your momentum in this direction, what you like, but the rest of the cloud is shrinking. Right. So this resistance, friction, basically it's, it's a kind of friction. We're just using electrons as friction. This is this repeated cooling channels and you keep passing the muons to the cooling channel and you do have to do it very, very quickly. The argument I've heard is that the amount of cooling you have to do is 10 to the minus 6. The original phase space of the muon has to be collapsed by 10 to the minus 6. And it's a six dimensional phase space. So in each dimension, you have to collapse by a factor of 10. One experiment has been done, the muon ionization cooling experiment. And that achieved, I think, 10 or 20% cooling. So in 10 years, we have demonstrated. 20% cooling. We have to do a factor of a million cooling. So we better launch lots and lots of cooling attempts, this technique, that technique, over and over. And if that's not happening, then you tell me how long it takes to get those breakthrough 10 to the 6 cooling. And so it seems always like cold fusion, it's like fusion, right? It's always a very good strategy. This, 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 and this, and then maybe we'll have it. Many other issues too. You also need the big magnets. This is high field magnets, so all the proton collider issue also has to be solved here. But I'll just send you the two issues, which are unsolved. Yeah. Okay, let me speak. Um, EP, could you ask a question? Yeah. Um, uh, hi, Ashutosh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. You know, I have a comment on uh, galaxy rotation curves and on the assumption that they necessarily imply dark matter, of course, there is an alternate possibility that there is no dark matter and the Newtonian gravity might be breaking down. It would be very interesting if there were some independent astronomical system where one could check that one of the two possibilities will work but will not, dark matter or modified gravity. For the last couple of years, uh, the data and analysis and results coming in from the Gaia satellite for these astronomical systems, which are known as wide binaries. So hundreds of wide binaries uh, have been observed and their orbital speeds plotted. Uh, they have uh, orbital radii greater than 1000 astronomical units and at least two different groups have confirmed that these orbital speeds are not obeying Newtonian gravity. Now here, it's not possible to fit the answer with dark matter because the, you can't have that much dark matter on such a small scale. So it seems that if you go away from galactic dynamics and look at wide binaries, they are favoring breakdown of Newtonian gravity over dark matter. And this is something which we should watch out in the next few years. I just wanted to uh, share that uh, information. Thank you. Thanks, Yeah, some people will say thumbs up. We have to check other hypotheses before we all jump on the dark matter bandwagon. Yeah, we, should never, we should never all jump onto the same bandwagon. So, as you heard me say, TP, my, my perspective on dark matter is that from the field theory side, there is no reason for the spectrum of fields we have observed to, so far to be it. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. Uh, if I may sell my own work, I in my work, I'm seeing evidence for a fifth force, which could be responsible for breakdown of Newtonian gravity, but I'm not seeing any evidence for a new dark matter particle. So that that's that's telling my my my, my part of the world. Okay. I think you. Is that okay? If you move on. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. Better and come back to the student question. 
Okay. Uh, so we showed that graph on the back end of the right? Okay. So I showed we showed a graph on the back end of the Okay, right? Back to the back end of the Okay, yes. Because of the X to top coupling being large enough. Yes. So on the lambda has to go upside down. Yes. So uh, why do you think that requires the case? I mean, what is it hand for? And that you know, that's where the work is. Look, I'm an experimentalist born in this universe. So I'd like to understand this universe from the perspective of every experimental check you can do in this universe to see if the explanation for this universe lies in this universe. So before you say that this universe can only be explained by having other universes, I would say let's see if this universe is self explanatory. Uh, yeah, you. no, I'll I'll be quick. Uh, and uh, can you hear me, Asutosh? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is a question, not a comment. Last time it was a comment, and we can discuss that later on. The question is, uh, my take home from your colloquium is that we need more precise measurement of the Higgs boson properties and this dark matter part. You know, TP said things like, of course, I, we would like to hear that what is that prediction of expectation for a collider physicist for us to measure. We will do that. We are not agnostic dark matter or non dark matter. But between the various collider we have in the market, I'm forgetting about the muon and hadron, I'm talking of E plus E minus linear versus circular. Can you be a little provocative to say, in terms of these two big questions of the dark matter, non-dark matter, whatever, versus the Higgs boson properties uh, measurement, which is the one you would like to put uh, money into? Uh, since I have no money, so <laughs> where would I like to put other people's money into? Yes. <laughs> Uh, see, there is there are accidents in nature that have engineered certain things, right? And people have, like Weinberg have picked on accidents. It comes back to the end of question. As to this had happened, we would be like this. This one of them is the neutron to proton situation. So the neutron to protons are just a little bit heavier than the proton. And so slowly the neutron decays to a proton, and so we are happy. Now imagine a universe, a tropic, whatever, where for some reason or the other, the symmetry is a little different this side or the other. And the, the weakly interactive equivalent of the neutron, the neutron is weakly interactive, right? Why you discover the neutron? A good thing that that's not the one that's stable. But suppose in field theory, a little bit of a tweak beyond standard model, this or that, were to produce a spectrum where there is some heavy charged particle and its neutral cousin is like the one there, just like the neutron proton, but the other way, you know, what does it take to make that accident happen? Then I start to think that an E plus E minus or a lepton collider machine. It's all which way do you want to bet? So I am kind of comfortable saying that a bet where there is a degeneracy like this, which only a lepton collider can find because you have a total missing energy, missing momentum, missing four momentum constraint in a lepton collider, which a hadron collider doesn't have. This is the sort of signal that the LFC is. Mm, is difficult to detect because even though you have missing mass, so some heavy thing decays to a light thing, lighter thing, this could be happening, but there is no missing momentum. There is only missing mass mostly. So in a situation like this, before going to a very high energy proton machine, right away after the LSE, so we still have to go to the LSE. I think it makes sense to look in the other phase spaces with an E plus E minus machine that LFC cannot do. So come 2045, the LFC is done and we are unlucky and LFC couldn't find. 
One option is, oh, it's all at higher energy. That's one way of thinking, so let's go to the higher energy load on. And the other is, what could the NHC not do? And so let's build an electron collider or ideally neon collider, but I don't see the neon collider happening on that time scale. So I like, for example, the cold copper technology. I think technology development is what we should do. So that technology can build an E plus E minus linear collider for the same length of the ILC at four times the energy. So ILC used to talk about one TV, maybe with cold copper you can go to three TV or something, which is similar to click. So that's something new on the table. A big circular E plus E minus is a very high luminosity machine for precision, but it's not a high energy collider. I am, of course, always for precision. But if I had to choose between a high precision E plus E minus machine, which is circular but low energy, versus this cold copper technology, for example, that has the potential to get us to 1.5 TV or 2 TV on a cost and physical size, like a fit at Fungal Lab or something like this, it's somehow an exciting option, a new option that brings a new flavor to the whole thing. So I'd encourage, what do I have to decide now? Where to put R&D money, right? You don't have to put money into the collider. You just have to put R&D money. I personally am willing to say, let's put money into this new linear collider electron. Okay. That doesn't take a lot of money today. It creates a new option. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krishna. That was very nice. Uh, Gagan, uh, is that okay? Okay, we may have lost by that. Okay, thank you very much and thank you all for joining in uh, for this colloquium. Uh, um, and I would like uh, to have a warm round of applause for the speaker again. Can we can walk to the right hand for the next Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we are there are standard answers and non-standard answers. The standard answer is let's go big circular and high high luminosity precision machine. Right. right. There's no way I'd say no to that. <laughs> I'm just precision all along. But but there is something psychologically cool. I mean, it's a nice name, that's it. They really lean cold copper. Another thing I get the chance to mention is this is not even liquid medium. This is liquid nitrogen. Okay. So, oh. all the cryogenic stuff is amazingly simpler compared to superconducting RM. Liquid nitrogen is like water, right? Oh. Who is peer-reading this? Jefferson? Slack. Slack. Those guys always come out with something because they here, there, and then they. Oh, slack is not into optics, is it? Laser and all that stuff. No. Slack does many things, but I always like them having technological leadership ideas, <laughs> whereas others tend to become like, what can we projectize? What can we sell to the funding agency? What will everybody gang up behind? That's a typical thinking of large other labs, <laughs> which they have to do. But, this but then there's a maverick-like thing is always a good thing, right? Yeah. So this will be quite revolutionary. You said 135, because 42 or 43 yeah. MEV, like, but even it, it was kind of the maximum without beam for yeah. Jefferson Lab and also from yeah. 135. Yeah. I haven't heard from Oak Ridge person yeah. saying 150. <laughs> I don't know. People will oversell it. All that is true. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody has ever got it. But they're talking.